Hello everyone and welcome back to Solid State Physics in a Nutshell, brought to you by the Physics Department at the Colorado School of Mines. I'm Eric. And I'm Nicole. Today our goal is to look at diffraction for thin films and introduce the Omega Rocking Curve Scan. You'll typically use this technique on an epitaxial thin film where there's a crystallographic relationship between the thin film orientation and the substrate you're growing on. So for example, growing aluminum arsenide on gallium arsenide? Exactly. The lattice parameters of the two materials don't match exactly, but they're close, and the film lattice is oriented with the substrate lattice. That being said, high quality epitaxy usually requires the mismatch to be less than 1%. Any more than that, and there would start to be considerable strain of the interface. Okay, so now that we've got the real space structure, let's take a look at reciprocal space. If the film is relatively thin, an incoming wave will interact with both the substrate and the film at the same time. We can then create a reciprocal space made of the superposition of the thin film and substrate reciprocal lattices, with the G1 direction pointing to the right and the G3 axis pointing up. And because the thin film has a bigger lattice in real space, it has a smaller reciprocal cell. So as we move out in reciprocal space, we see the spacing between the film and the substrate lattice points get bigger as so. Then if we did an omega 2 theta scan, where delta k points in the G1 direction, the first reflection we'd see is the 001 for the thin film, and then the same reflection for the substrate. And this would continue for the 002 reflection, and so on and so on, until we see an intensity pattern that looks like this. But remember, this would be for the ideal case where the film and the substrate are perfectly aligned. On the other hand, if we have a completely disordered system like a powder, on our substrate, our reciprocal space for the film would be made of concentric spheres and the intensity specter would have extra peaks. In reality, a film that is only partially epitaxial will have some of the grains oriented correctly and some of them will be slightly tilted. In that case, our reciprocal space would have the dots for the substrate lattice and short arcs for the thin film reciprocal lattice. So if we do an omega-2 theta scan in that case, it would be really hard to distinguish this partially epitaxial film from a perfect film. Sounds like we need a scan that looks at the short arcs in reciprocal space. Yeah, that's exactly right. And for that, we have the omega rocking curve. For this type of scan, we fix our source and our detector so that our delta k vector never changes. This measurement takes a bit of planning. You want to set up delta k so that it hits one of our sample arcs. Then, as the name suggests, we tilt the sample about the angle omega. And as we do so, we drag the film arc through our delta k vector. This results in a spreading of our original delta function. And we use the full width half maximum value to get a quantitative measure of the amount of out of plane orientation. So to recap, we looked at the reciprocal space for epitaxial thin films on a substrate. We then introduced the omega rocking curve, which gave us a quantitative measure of out-of-plane orientation. But if delta k is perpendicular to the sample normal, which so far it has been, this type of scan won't tell us anything about the in-plane orientation. But luckily, we'll cover that technique in the next video. Before we head out, if you'd like more practice with superposition of reciprocal lattices, draw what the reciprocal space would look like for a tetragonal thin film grown on a cubic substrate. And here's the second question. If we do an omega rocking curve on the 0, 1 reflection, how do you think the full width half maxima will change if we go out and measure it on the 0, 2 reflection? Thanks for watching today's Solid State Physics in a Nutshell. See you next time.